Welcome everyone to the um, licensing webinar series brought to you by the Australian National Data Service. Um, this is our first for 2013, which we're um, pretty excited about. There's a whole series there. So, um, in fact, today we're starting off with a, a, a terrific guest. We've got uh, Diane Peters uh, from Creative Commons. Diane, you with us? I am. Thanks. Hello, Diane. And uh, you're in. Uh, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from Portland, Oregon. It's um, just north of uh, San Francisco by about 500 miles, and south of Seattle by about the same distance. And I assume, seeing as though it's sweating hot in Canberra, it must be uh, freezing cold up there in uh, Oregon at the moment. Well, rainy and cold, yes. <laughs> All right. uh, well, anyway, thanks for what staying up after dinner. Is that right to uh, talk to us today? That's right. It's not too late. I'm pleased to be here. I hope you've got a uh, an appropriate after dinner beverage with you to cheer you up. Um, Baden, we also have today a uh, um, regular guest, uh, Baden Appleyard. How are things, Baden? Good Adrian. Good Adrian, back again. Happy New Year, everybody. Yes, yes. Good to get licensing back on the agenda again into 2013, which is looking to be a really exciting year uh, as far as uh, open access to data and uh, licensing and reuse. Uh, we are very excited. Um, and so we'll be hearing from Baden throughout the year uh, on regular intervals uh, through this uh, series of webinars. Uh, what we've got installed today is a uh, presentation from Diane Peters about um, Creative Commons and what's uh, topical with uh, Creative Commons, particularly uh, some new directions that are coming out in uh, 2013. Uh, we will also have our regular update with um, Baden Appleyard on developments of uh, in the uh, OSGOL, the Australian Government's Open Access and Licensing Framework. Uh, we'll have time for your um, questions and answers and discussion. If you're on the webinar, you will see a little, um, what do we call the control panel. And if you check down towards the bottom, there's a little chat window. So if you have any questions at any time during the uh, presentation, I would jot them in there. And uh, we'll either take them as they come or um, look at them as a whole after uh, Diane's presentation and after Baden's. So anyway, as soon as you think of something, just uh, jot it in there and um, we may, either, depending on how the gods of technology are going, we may uh, cut across to you if, if you've got a, a microphone and speakers, otherwise I can just read them out and um, we'll take the discussion that way. So lots of interesting stuff uh, today. Um, I'll speak to you more again about uh, our plan and for the uh, future webinars uh, on licensing and other webinars a bit later. Let's start with uh, Diane, so very excited actually. Diane is the general counsel for uh, Creative Commons and um, as we said, she's um, based in, in the States but uh, has sort of oversees the whole of Creative Commons uh, legal strategy and um, is really been uh, quite instrumental in the new versions of uh, Creative Commons that are coming out at the moment. So that's what we're hoping to be able to talk to, uh, hear from Diane about and talk to her about. Um, she's been uh, involved previously in the uh, open source development labs, which has become the Linux Foundation, as well as uh, more legal work with uh, Mozilla. And I believe she's been working at Creative Commons for uh, a few, quite a few years now. So, uh, Diane, do you have a? Uh, how are we going to do a? Uh, do you have some slides that you can that you'll be sharing with us? Is that right? Let's see if our, how the technology gods are going. Whether we can cut across to Diane's slides. That looks good. Looking good. I can certainly see that. Excellent, Adrian. And so thanks so very much to Adrian and thanks so much to Alex and the support team and also to Baden. Um, as Baden said, you know, Happy New Year to all. 
oh my goodness, I didn't realize we would still have our 4.0 licenses not published at this time, but that's for good reason, as I'll explain shortly. Um, it has been a very busy year, and I couldn't be more privileged and honored to be sort of at the helm of the stewardship of the 4.0 licenses. Um, this is not an easy task for myself, but also for the many affiliates around the world and others who are deeply invested and care about our licenses. Um, so I'm honored to be here. You know, data is it for us in a large way for this next year. Um, we're very excited about how the new licenses address many of the um, complaints that people had and, and, and caused um, disuse of our licenses in the past. Um, and so hence, I'm eager to see 4.0 get out the door. Um, so here we are. Um, I thought I would start briefly, very briefly, with a bit of history about Creative Commons and the evolution of the CC license suite. Um, to start off with, um, license version name is very important to Creative Commons. Um, we take our stewardship responsibilities very seriously. Um, we started, we have now had licenses out and in the public for 12 years, uh, and many of those, there's probably 550 plus licenses that we have published if you account for all of the ported licenses within each of the versions of the suites. And here on the slide, you can see the progression. Every time we version the licenses, we're listening to our community. We also have our fingers on the pulse of legislative changes, what we anticipate to be new problems, um, and, and try to plan ahead. And no um, more seriously than, than ever have we been listening to our affiliates when they came to us and said, you know, our 3.0 suite isn't working for a very important constituency. And hence, um, that was one of the major impetuses for starting the 4.0 process. So why are we versioning? I've just alluded to one of those, um, but there's, there are several others that should not be lost on, on the crowd. Um, internationalization of the license suite is extremely important to Creative Commons. We have had four versions of the suite that were all very US-centric. 3.0 attempted to be very generic and attempt to, you know, get out of this U.S. mold and try to make an international license. We have been somewhat successful, but we recognize we have more places, um, more improvements that we could make. Um, there are many places in the world where, because there is not a, you know, inter, um, you know, some country here that that there's not a license there for them to adopt, they feel excluded from the Creative Commons community. And so we feel it's imperative to have an international suite that speaks to everyone around the globe that is as enforceable as possible, works just as an intended in as many jurisdictions as possible. Interoperability is a second major reason for the versioning process, and, and I'll talk about the, the details of that in just a moment. Interoperability is, the, is sweetly defined as being able to take content um, licensed in one way, remix it, add other content to it if you want, and then still be able to license it in a way that satisfies the conditions of the original license plus all of the other licenses that are in play. So how is it that we can promote interoperability? We have four licenses in our suite that allow for derivative works to be made. And I'll talk in just a minute about how we hope to improve interoperability with the revisions that we're making to the suite. Um, this is particularly important, by the way, for those of you who are well aware of the increasing number of open government licenses that are springing up around the world. Um, Creative Commons has talked um, often and frequent and tried to interject in, in those conversations. There are very legitimate reasons for those licenses to be popping up ones that Creative Commons can't address, but our goal here is to allow for data 
database um, data sets, content to to travel across these schisms, these silos of incompatibly licensed content currently, so that these things can be remixed. Um, so speeding up just a bit, um, we also have some important adopters that you all might be interested in hearing about. We have a lot of IGOs who are very interested and intrigued by sharing at the global level. They have a couple of unique concerns that we've been working on hard at trying to address. Um, they have special privileges and immunities from uh, from legal processes in local countries and national laws and so trying to adjust albeit in a very nuanced way our licenses so that they can embrace and be part of the community is something that's very important to us so we're working on that um, foremost for this group is expanding the scope of the license grant and improving the license so that it meets the needs of data and public sector information providers and all of the communities that um, produce it, whether they're governmental or not, the projects um, that, that gather and have massive collaborations around providing data that in turn gets used for um, map work and, 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 and geologistics and, and uh, et cetera, that's very important to us. So sui generis database rights were a major obstacle for us and um, we're fixing that in 4.0. Um, so just a few of our core principles when we version. Um, we have tried very hard and in fact no harder in 4.0 than ever before to be transparent, open, and inclusive. And we do that in a variety of ways. We have open publication lists, email lists, we have an open wiki anyone can edit, we have regional calls with our affiliates, we are willing to engage bilaterally with anyone Tell us what you need, tell us what your issues are, we're very happy to hear it. So take this to heart and please, um, at the end of the presentation, feel free to contact me um, if you have any concerns or issues. Um, better yet, you also have a CC Australia um, uh, affiliate that's based out of QUT. There are excellent people there as well. Um, there's myriad ways for you to engage with us on the, on the versioning process. Um, we also have this robust international legal review. We have this amazing affiliate network. I, I have, was shocked when I first came to Creative Commons. We have like 70 jurisdictions with legal experts in copyright, in data, in you know, spanning the entire spectrum and these people do this stuff for free and they show up, they put forth their ideas, they review our licenses, they tell us where we're wrong, they help us get it right. It's a very collaborative, amazing community and the result of that are these extremely robust licenses and we couldn't be more thankful for them because without them we could not be doing the work we do. We also, in this process of being engaging with licensed stewards, um, one of our highest goals here is interoperability, compatibility. We've been in close contact with the Free Software Foundation. There's a lot of code and content that is very closely being remixed, and the idea that maybe GPL version 3 and our by SA version 4 might be able to interoperate in a way that allows those the content and the code to be shared um, compatibly is uh, is very exciting for us. We also have the free art license um, folks, Antoine Moreau, etc. They've been great. And then finally, we we do document like we there's probably too much information. Everyone's probably bored of hearing from us, but my goodness, on our wiki, that's all we do. We document, document. If anyone ever wants to see how a decision's been made, go there you'll find it. We're, we'll be accountable. We are accountable. We want to be transparent. We're open on, on the documentation issue. So process and status and then I'll pause for any questions on, on this part of it. Um, this has been a really long process. Um, I didn't realize it would quite be so long. Here we are in 2013. I thought this would get done in 2012, but here we are and the, the licenses will be the better for it, however. So we had this requirements gathering process, big learning moment for Creative Commons. People don't respond without something in front of them. 
we thought that was a good way to proceed, but maybe those months weren't as well spent as they could have been, but we tried to gather what do you want, what do you want to see in 4.0. We posted um, our first draft, you can see it here in April. We worked through August on that first draft. We then posted a second draft um, in August. This was supposed to only be a two month period. It ended up taking us as many months to get us to February. And there were really important reasons for that. Um, again, we think the license is better because of it, but we wanted to really get down the issue of sui generis database rights that I'll talk about in a moment. We wanted to really focus on some attribution requirements that were sticky. And we wanted to think hard about interoperability and internationalization. Internationalization is particularly hard because the licenses get used in a variety of places. There are a lot of rights in play, permissions in play, conditions in play, and how is it that we, you can make a robust international license that doesn't have to be ported necessarily? That's been our challenge. So here we are. You can see draft three. We posted it just last Friday. You kind folks are the um, beta audience for the presentation that I'm about to give as I dig into details. But we hope to, to have that done by the end of the second quarter or first quarter. We're working on some implementation issues around the chooser and the deed. That may take a little bit, but now is the time to participate if you want to. And I'll get into some more details, but maybe I'll pause here. Adrian or Baden, any thoughts you might have on, on what I've just covered before I speed up through the other issues? Uh, you've just alerted me to a, um, a very important point that we might chat on later, Diane, and that is about the license chooser and updates you're looking at making there. Um, the Ausgol uh, website has a license chooser tool on it that goes back to, I think, when I put it together in 2008. Um, and we've got a spec out at the moment. Uh, we're about to rebuild that license chooser tool to uh, meet more modern needs. And so it'd be very good to, um, I suppose, interpose uh, the code that comes out of your license chooser in with our one as well. The difference with uh, your one is uh, is that you kind of presuppose uh, a situation and what license would like to be applied. We've got some prerequisite questions about privacy and a few other things like that to go through. Um, but it'd be very good to work with you on that or work with Creative Commons on that. We, we, I'm so glad you raised that. This is an issue that um, uh, many of our affiliates and um, our larger community have asked us about. Our, our license chooser embeds in it without any visibility to the people who are using it, a variety of really important choices. So how we present our licenses, how we present our options. Um, for example, um, in 3.0, we have a variety of jurisdictional drop downs. So you can choose to apply a license that has been ported. That means adapted for local law and then also translated. And those adapted licenses, you can choose them. There's not a whole lot of information about that in the chooser currently. But it also doesn't tell you that maybe you're not getting the latest version of the license, which is something that we've always promoted and supported as Creative Commons. So there are embedded decisions in the chooser that we want to make more transparent. I fear, um, I, f I think that the likely outcome of 4.0 and 3.0 is that we may end up with two different choosers. Um, the, the reality is that 4.0 we're going to be having official translations, Baden, and not so much ports, although those are welcome if there's a demonstrated need for the ports to take place, but we do expect them to be more around translations as opposed to that. Additionally, as I'll talk in just a moment, there are a few dimensions to the 4.0 um, licenses that are different qualitatively from the 3.0 licenses in terms of scope of coverage, how termination works, etc., such that it might be wise to separate those. But I look forward to having um, a great conversation with the community 
over how we can can best facilitate easy understanding but um, solid understanding and education around what people licensors are choosing when they apply a license. So Diane, just to um, take a small step back, um, could you uh, when you see just that difference between porting and tra and translating and just using the international license? What's the could you tease out the difference in those uh, terms of the way you're using them? Absolutely. So the licenses, at least as of 3.0, the unported, what we now call the international licenses, were based on international verbiage, definitions, concepts, the idea being that the license operates where copyright operates, regardless of whether someone calls something an adaptation or a derivative work under their copyright law is just one clear example, or what a work is, quote unquote, um, that may differ. But the, the international licenses as a 3.0 were intended to work internationally. That said, it does make some sense, and it had made some sense particularly in the past because we had just come off a US-based license for local teams to dig into and say, well, we don't call it a derivative here, we call it an adaptation. Or our definition of work is slightly different. Or this is how disclaimer should be phrased in our jurisdiction. And that's not quite what we say, what you say in the United States, for example. So these are the small tweaks which are intended not to change how the license operates, but to make them more readily understandable um, and, and uh, enforceable in local jurisdictions. So that's the adaptation piece um, or the, the tweaking for understandability and robustness under local law. And then there's the translation. There are many jurisdictions where you cannot go to court and enforce an English an English language license. Um, Italy is one example. We, we have this amazing team in Italy and their government could really use an Italian translation of our CC0 tool, our public domain tool, and hopefully just our 4.0 international tool. Um, it's just important for them to have an Italian official translation for enforcement purposes, but that's, that would then be a linguistic translation not an adaptation where we're changing and adapting the small things to make it um, more understandable and accessible to, to the locality. And as a trend, you're saying that the, um, you think there'll be less need uh, as you move on for uh, locally ported licenses and that translations of the of the main license, I suppose, of the international license uh, would be increasingly sufficient. Is that is that a, a fair comment? That's a fair comment. That's our that's our hope. That's the aspiration. I don't mm -hmm. know that we'll get to it all the way in 4.0, but I think we'll go a long ways. And and let me just remind everyone that's listening, there. There's an important underlying um, facility that, that comes with having a single license that can work everywhere. There are many countries where they feel, again, excluded from accessing Creative Commons because they don't have a localization. And there may be some differences that we cannot bridge, but we have engaged our international team and we will be pushing them very hard but also listening and understanding where we can't make it work, um, but we will be pushing them hard to see if we can't do it. The GPL manages to do it well. The Free Art License has translations. They manage to do it well. There are other examples, um, although not as prominent as GPL, but we think that it's something, especially given the talent and expertise of our affiliates, we should be able to make it work most places. Okay, good. Um, I'm sure we'll get uh, some more detail as you, as you move forward. Just uh, again, just before we move on to that, how many people are involved in this kind of a process of, of um, 
pushing this forward uh, and you know how many affiliates are there and just to give us an idea of the scope of this change. Ah, oh, that's a good question. So we started this with about 65 to 70 affiliates, um, and affiliates just means a country where we have someone or one or more pe persons who are undertaking the efforts of Creative Commons there, and those affiliates could be two or three universities in a given location. The Dutch team, for example, has three different major institutions behind the Creative Commons process there, but roughly 70 affiliate. 70 countries um, with about 150 individual or, or organizational persons behind the, the porting. I'm proud to say that we probably have about 80% participation right now. We just were trying to tally up who's participated in the regional calls, who's given us comments, and it's about 80% of those 70 countries who have given us um, really pointed feedback on the licenses. Well, I'm surprised that you've been able to bring out a new, uh, <laughs> you got this far in the short time that it's taken in the uh, oh. gen general experience of international sort of techno and legal diplomacy. It's, uh, it's a miracle that you've been able to make the the progress wow. that you have with all those stakeholders and keeping them all on board, of course. But. Well, short, short for you, long for us, but <laughs> but well, but well worth it. But well worth it. I mean, we we have some really outstanding teams. The you know Australia, we have the Dutch. We have about you know two dozen teams who really rise to the challenge and have been exceptional. So, um, thank we're very thankful for them. Okay, so, well, tell us about you know what the what's what's new in these licenses. Great. So. I've directed the comments here for um, features and improvements that are really, you know, what might interest the audience here. So data projects and providers, maybe some librarians. Um, now, sui generis database rights don't exist in Australia, and in many, so most... Diane, could I just ask you, uh, if sure. I, did lat I did Latin at school, and I'm fairly proud of it. Um, <laughs> however, uh, just remembering exactly sui generis, that means like it's a special right, is that right? That's right, it's without reference to any particular underlying right. That's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a created right, it's a manufactured right in a way. So this is when they're saying we need a special thing for databases. That's what the, a sui generis right is. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And so happy to happy to share that while I'm not an expert on these things, although I feel like I'm getting there, um, sui generis database rights were established in the European Union, and the purpose was to reward um, investment in the aggregation, the the um, cultivation, the curation of data the organization of the data in a way that copyright doesn't protect. Um, you have a couple of great ANDs um, uh, summaries that describe the, you know, the what, how copyright applies to databases and how sui generis database rights apply. It's really a very localized right. Um, the European Union established it. All of those countries that are subject to um, the legislation that have implemented it. There are also a few countries who, through free trade agreements, have implemented something that is like a sui generis database right. So that would be countries like Korea, Mexico, Russia. These are giving rights that are like copyright, but based on investment in the curation of the works. Um, and, and so there are a lot of different rules and regulations around it, but it, the, think of it as um, a complement to copyright for those um, jurisdictions. They don't apply everywhere. So that's the idea of the sui generis, meaning this is not something that's you know, uh, perhaps covered in the copyright, uh, in the rights of, uh, of copyright, but it's uh, its own special right that applies to databases. That's right. It's it's certainly not among the original authors, you know, droit d'auteur of, you know, the author's rights. This mm -hmm. is something that applies to non-creative databases in which a substantial investment has been made by the maker. So the European Union have said, well, you know, perhaps the um, databases uh, uh, would not be caught up in the protections allocated under copyright, so we're making a special database, right? 
Well, so the, the, the persons in, in the European Union thought that this was a wise choice. Um, we could debate policy. I'm very happy to do that. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the right conversation to have here, maybe for another of the copyright seminars, but, um, but it, is, it is supposed to be dif different. Right, so copyright is creativity and the selection and arrangement of facts, and you have a right in the in the in that element of it because there's creativity being applied to um, the creation of a database. So to the extent it's just, for example, a phone book that's you know just an aggregation of facts that doesn't attract copyright at least in the United States under Feist and in many other jurisdictions, but to the extent someone expends a lot of money to create and curate and organize and make it searchable and those kinds of elements, then yes, that attracts this different right, which is similar to and sort of a butts copyright. Good, good. So we don't need to understand any more about, about the, that distinction, but we're, if, as far as your work is concerned, uh, the Creative Commons licenses map back uh, already to sort of uh, copyright uh, rights, and in the, uh, if I understand it, in this version four, you're trying to map them as well to this uh, special right that exists in some jurisdictions. That's right. So, so 4.0, we made the decision back last September that it's really important for us to acknowledge these rights. What we've learned even since then is that the existence of these rights that a lot of governments and important makers of databases have that can't be licensed um, under Creative Commons 3.0 licenses, or if they are licensed, they're neutralized and there are no conditions that attach, that we need to affirmatively license these, have them be subject to the license conditions, but only insofar as they exist um, by, the, by the licensor and only insofar as those rights, um, the, they apply to the use of the license. So the first slide I have up right now is to emphasize this. Even though Australia and the United States and many other countries, most other countries, do not have sui generis database rights, it is important to understand how this now works. Um, only makers have these rights and may license them using the licenses. So um, if I'm in the United States and I make a database, I don't get sui generis database rights or better said, if I create a database that has no copyright protection and I apply a CC license, it's not as if I can start to run around the world and enforce quote unquote sui generis database rights against you in Australia or any place else. So it's a limit. It's limited in terms of who's um, can license these rights under the licenses. Additionally, licensees need not comply with the license terms where those rights don't apply to them. So to the extent I'm sitting in the United States and I download a, a sui generis a database from the European Union, I in the United States am subject to United States copyright law for the most part, and I will caveat that, those rights will not apply to me. So I am not restricted as a matter of copyright or sui generis database rights from extracting and reusing the content. So just to be, to sum it up, and I'm happy to provide more information, the rights are contained to those who have them and to, um, and they only apply and the license conditions only apply, come into play where the licensee is subject to those rights because of their use. So if you don't have them and you're sitting in Australia, you're not a maker from Australia, there's rules inside of the, the database um, directive about who gets these rights. There are also some treaties that can be made or free trade agreements that can be made that establish them, but for the most part, the general rule would be if you're a maker of a database and you're sitting in a country like the United States and the database doesn't attract copyright, because of the selection and arrangement, we don't have an independent right, another right like the sui generis database right that would allow me to apply a CC license and therefore go out and say, everyone, you have to apply and abide by the license rules because I have these rights. So they're confined.
Um, so a second thing, happy to come back to that if people have questions. Um, a big thing in 4.0, we have added flexibility for attribution requirements and we know and we've heard loud and clear from the data community in particular, the scholarly community, the scientific community, that it's really important to have this flexibility built into the attribution requirements. So um, all requirements are now, for the first time in 4.0, going to be subject to a reasonable to the means, medium, and context. Um, context is new, or um, this is new here, and the reason it's new is we really wanted to um, allow for you know, norms, sorry, context norms to come into play to help people understand what they needed to do. So to the extent you are the polar commons and you're sharing, um, you know, information under a CC license and the context in which you share it says that you can abbreviate attribution requirements in a certain way and that's customary for us, then that is something you can do under our licenses. So it's trying to account for not just the means, whether it's wirelessly and over the internet or in hard um, analog versions, or the medium, is it burned somewhere, is it played in a, um, is it announced over a loudspeaker at a conference, and the, but the context, so contextualization is really important now. Um, we also make very specific something that was implied in 3.0, which is the ability to link to separate resource pages. Um, so instead of trying to lump everything on top of uh, an aggregated work or a remixed work where there are five different authors or contributors to that work, you can now just simply provide a link that uh, leads people to a resource page where all of the attribution requirements are are fulfilled. We also have made very clear that licensors can waive some or all of the attribution requirements and this is even if people haven't made an adaptation. Um, in 3.0 you had to make an adaptation or uh, have a collection be made in order for the removal requirement to come into play and we heard pretty clear that you know there's not always those cases where people can be reusing our works where without, in the absence of an adaptation or in the absence of a collection, we're still uncomfortable with it. So we've improved and allowed licensors to ask that the attribution requirements be removed. Here's so, one that... Uh, Diane, sorry Diane, um, on that, the, the, the kind of things we hear about is people saying, oh well I've taken this data set, it's now, you know, being entirely merged into another, into a greater information service and uh, you know it may be you know contributing to some visualization and it's not convenient or or even expected I suppose that on every uh, visualization that there is a some way of saying that some of this data came from the Australian Bureau of Statistics mm -hmm. or something like that so is it, are they the kind of um, uh, issues that are that are trying to be um, addressed by this kind of a, a change? That's, that's, a, that's a really great example. So in that context, you can, um, instead of having all of that aggregated together and being readily parent, you can simply have a link to a resource page where that information is provided, <laughs> which um, is something that I'll get to a little later on some stacking issues, but for the most part there's um, explicit permission in the license to use reasonable means to provide attribution and if that's a link away to something, mm -hmm. then that's perfectly acceptable. Good. So one thing that everyone here, I, we would love your feedback on still open for discussion are the um, Uniforce, uh, the URL and link back requirements. So we've included in draft three a requirement that um, you have to indicate if the work here, I've, I've included database here, that's not what the license actually says, it says the work or the license material, if it's modified even if no derivative has been made, but if you've if you fiddled with or added additional data, et cetera, then you should include, you need to, as a requirement, include a link back to where the database, the data set that hasn't been modified. 
So this is a different requirement than we had in 3.0. The requirement in 3.0 is that only if you create an adaptation of the work or the thing that's being licensed do you have to provide a link back um, or indicate that modifications, sorry, have been made. You always have to provide a link back in 3.0, but if a modification, then that's when you have to say, I modified this work, here's where you can find the original. Now it's any modification, even if it's not an adaptation. And the reason we inserted this is um, we've been hearing from a lot in the data community about their concerns over, you know, when scientists get together and they, and they fiddle with data sets, I mean, how people do science is they fiddle with the data sets, but maybe not in a way that implicates copyright or creates an adaptation or implicates sui generis database rights. So how is it that we might indicate that so that downstream scientists know that, hey, that wasn't the original, original data set, that was the data set that was added to or fiddled with by scientist number two. So this is why we introduced it. It is open for discussion. We would love to hear feedback from this community and other scholarly and scientific communities on what is the right link back requirement. Good. Well, I think that means it's kind of a call for some use case scenarios that would say, well, here's how, this is how we are. Uh, reusing data, and um, that would be able to inform you know, these kind of questions as to how you do it if it's modified. What does what, what does modified? You know, I assume this um, definition things with you know modified and adapted, etc. So yeah, if they have different requirements, yeah. I think yeah, at least we could give some examples there that say, well, here's an example of some data that's being reused in a particular portal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, just today, um, at a, a couple hours ago, we posted to the CC license development list a prompt that lays out the considerations on this particular issue. Um, at the end of my presentation on the final page, you'll see a place where you can subscribe to that list and you can go in and look at that particular post if you're not already a member and please provide feedback there. Um, so moving to other things here, um, other attribution related features in draft three, no endorsement. Well, that's not new. Everyone just should feel confirmed that that's not going to change. Um, no one can use attribution in a way that implies endorsement. Um, there are no warranties. Um, I'll pause here. There was a big push by a few folks to include an affirmative representation and warranty by licensors that they had all of the rights that they needed in order to license the material that was under the CC license. This is reminiscent of what we did in 1.0. There was a hard fought battle moving to 2.0 and 2.1 and 2.5 and 3.0, but that whole span, we've never offered warranties. And there are multiple reasons for that. Um, it's not as if we don't want to encourage or you know, have people engage in best behavior, but there's a whole wiki page at the end that there's a link to. People can go and look at the pros and cons. But what we do encourage our customized disclaimers. Um, we also have in just a moment I'll show you a new page on our um, a new part of our license which um, has before licensing considerations to better encourage licensors to undertake rights clearances for example um, but this is something that has stayed the same although they can offer it. In the end you know there's attribution, easy it's flexible, it's still required, but you can do it in a variety of ways that hopefully will ease some of the pains of the data and scientific community. Karen, uh, sorry, Diane, can I just stop you for a moment and just go back to the point on uh, warranties. How do you see that working operationally? Do they insert the warranty clause somewhere uh, into a copyright statement or how, how does that work? So the license right now provides, that's an excellent question. The license right now provides that it's a notice that gets attached 
to the work. So like the copyright notice, we anticipate it being actually part of the copyright notice. It would be a notice saying, I offer warranties or more likely, here's the um, disclaimer, here's my customized disclaimer because this is how my jurisdiction tells me I need to adjust the disclaimer that's currently in the license so that it's most um, appropriate for my country. But we expect it'll be a notice feature um, that we think will be part of the copyright notices for the most part. We've thought about how that might be integrated into the chooser um, or a copyright notice wizard where people can insert the information that they want to have be persistent and have to be carried forward. Um, so it could include, you know, copyright, you know, ANDS, you know, 2013 licensed under uh, by you know, 4.0 license, here's our customized disclaimer because Australian law says this is how disclaimers ought to be written and um, here's, a, there's no further warranties offered. That would be the nature of what we think might be the, the preferred way to do it, although we're still working on that. It's certainly an issue that comes up, people wanting to uh, make sure that the license process, you know, going through this, putting a license on something also uh, takes care of any, you know, warranties and usually you're right, it's usually, um, you know, perhaps a government department or something like that saying, well, we don't, you know, we're providing this information uh, as is, but, you know, if somebody breaks their leg because of, um, you know, a discrepancy in the weather, uh, observations, then you know uh, that's you know you use the data at your own at your own risk, I suppose. That's right. But you know that there's there's you know reasonable disclaimers, etc. And as you say, they they change by jurisdiction. But you, I find that they the amount of risk that uh, people are willing to take you know varies from organisation to organisation. And uh, but um, it's heartening to know that there is a a, a very sort of straightforward path here for making sure that those warranties are part of the license procedure. Yeah. Adrian, we, we see this um, in terms of Ausgold implementation uh, around, the, around the country affecting some data portals uh, where you've got materials currently licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license that are downloadable from these data portals. But there is a secondary disclaimer that the jurisdiction has applied to that data set as well already. And, and quite frankly, that's confusing. It's confusing particularly if there's a, there's a significant difference between the disclaimers. And I think we, we'll think about uh, at Ausgol about what position we take. And uh, the, the current disclaimers are actually very good. And I would like to sort of see uh, use cases for using some, uh, if that's the language to use, uh, as to why uh, the current disclaimers are not acceptable. Um, but that's probably something we can we can talk about later another time. But just saying, does it rise? I've seen uh, situations where we have multiple disclaimers being used and, and it, I think for a user that can be very, um, very confusing. There's a take-home message here for me that, you know, it is, if you're worried about disclaiming, you know, disclaimers and warranties, um, there is a way to do that using this, uh, this licensing framework, so that's good. Diane, what else, what else is new in... Um, ah, so, what else do so this here? should be exciting. So thanks, um, exciting, I think. Um, we're all excited. This was a huge ask of a lot of institutional doctors and governments in particular. We've introduced in draft three an automatic reinstatement of the license if the violation is cured within 30 days of discovery. So reminder, um, under 3.0 and every other version of a Creative Commons license, you lose your rights automatically upon failure to um, adhere to the conditions. So if you've messed up attribution or if you've um, use the work in a, um, and created a derivative when you didn't think you were creating a derivative but it was under an ND work, uh, ND license or um, if you failed to apply a share alike or, or what have you, you lose your license under 3.0, you still lose it under 4.0 and, and it is still automatic 
But what happens now is that when you discover it upon discovery, if you cure it within 30 days of discovering it, then you get a reinstatement of the license. Now, caveat, that doesn't mean that licensors can feel like they're at a disadvantage. That's not the case. Licensors are specifically granted in the license the ability to recover. So if I take Baden's um, NC licensed blog post and I sell it for how much Baden? A million dollars. And then I say, oops, sorry, I discovered my violation and I fix it. Baden still has the ability to sue me to recover the million dollars or whatever I sold his blog post for. So licensors still have rights to recover or to insist on, you know, remedies for, during the, the violation. But, you know, that, those are, these are all extreme cases. I mean, most of the time what happens is I forgot to provide a link back. I didn't properly, you know, name every attribution party that Baden asked me to attribute um, in when I reused the Ausgol work. Or, you know, these are violations that are pretty, you know, trivial, but still under all of our licenses, say, you lose your license. It's designed to, to help institutional adopters in particular who want to leverage CC license works for high value reuse instances, um, whether it's in camp, you know, advertising campaigns, when it's a buy license or what have you. It's designed to help them have confidence that if they messed up, they can fix it and it's not going to be the end of the world. They still have to account for it, but they're, it's not as if they're an ongoing infringer under the license. So that doesn't good. require anything from the licensor as well to, to go out and regrant a particular license. It happens automatically. Nope, nope yeah. it happens automatically. Mm -hmm. So the other big thing um, everyone will see when you open the licenses, um, there's a link at the end, is there's a new section at the very beginning about using this public license which draws licensors to pre-licensing considerations and licensees. Just understand, please, how the licenses work and what they do and don't do. Baden, or Adrian, were you going to say something else? I apologize. No, no, I think that's good. Uh, okay. you, I think you've got interoperability and then some particular data things, so why don't we move yeah. on to those? That would be good. Yeah, yeah so I, um, I can actually pass over some of this. Um, I know we're running a little long on time. My apologies. Um, interoperability, it's an interesting subject. Yep. <laughs> interoperability is huge. Um, there have been a lot of open government licenses in particular that have come out. Um, you know, we've spoken, Creative Commons has spoken with many of them. We really care about proliferation issues, but if we can't stem, you know, stem the, the tide of those, because they, they aren't largely about you know, complaints about our licenses, they're more on other issues that we can't help control. If they're gonna be out there, then by, you know, why not make them interoperable? So we, we're really working on this. So for buy and buy and CSA, or buy SA and buy and CSA, this is share alike. We two main things: we're moving the core criteria out of the license, and we want to expand the compatibility mechanism that buy SA has to buy and CSA. And maybe I'll leave it there and just encourage people to look at the website, but. Long story short on the second proposal is that there's no other license out there that we might even contemplate in this day and age of being compatible, to be compatible with buy and CSA. But if we're looking ahead, if we're planning ahead, given the proliferation that happens despite Creative Commons, then we should plan for it so that we don't have to version to fix it in just another year. Um, so all of these will get a lot of air time. You guys will start seeing those posts to our blog in the next uh, week, actually. They're all lined up and finished. We're just staging them so that you all are not overwhelmed. Um, the other, the, probably the more important are, um, are buy and buy and see. So between buy SA and buy and CSA, 
the former slide here. And these two licenses, these are all of the licenses that allow for adaptations to be made. So between these four, this is where interoperability happens or it doesn't happen. In these two licenses, by especially, we have never specified how de derivatives must be licensed, adaptations. We've thought about this. People want to understand how, how adaptations work. And so the proposal in draft three, and you can see it, um, and I have a link at the bottom of this slide, um, that people can only license their contributions to a derivative or an adaptation on terms that allow users of the, the adaptation material th that they can satisfy both, the, both terms of both um, licenses. This is difficult. This is a tricky issue, but it's how copyright works, first and foremost. It's how all of our licenses have worked for the most part to date. Um, we haven't always been consistent on our messaging because we've been helping people license things in a way that makes it easy for downstream users, but this is a very intellectually honest approach to how adaptations work, and so we're floating it to our community, and we'll have a major post on this in just um, 24 hours. Good. That seems sensible that, that the original license sort of continues to have some influence. Right. Um, data mining. I can't believe this, this group must be interested in data and content mining. Um, this is weighed heavily on our science team in particular. I must say that um, how 4.0 treats data and content mining, we've received specific requests inundated with requests, could you please say that data and content mining is okay? It's complicated, right? So um, as all of you know, there are a myriad techniques and processes for mining and content um, content and data. Um, you can you can um, very in you know crawl the web, you can reproduce things, momentarily or, or just for a very short period of time on your, um, you know, on your computer. You can download, which is clearly a copy. There's many different ways this happens. There's no standard. To make it worse, there's no harmonization between jurisdictions on this. So there's no, it's not as if we have a treaty that says text and data mining for research or educational purposes is an exception or limitation that signatories must implement through national law. There's nothing like that. So this is a really uncertain landscape. And what is important to keep in mind is that, you know, CC licenses can really only do so much here, right? We are a copyright license, and now we are a, a license for sui generis database rights and those rights that are very closely abutted to copyright. And that's what we do. So even though it's complicated everywhere else, in 4.0, we think it's pretty clear. So if what you're doing implicates copyright or the sui generis database rights, so if you're downloading or if under the laws of your jurisdiction you are keeping for longer than some ephemeral copy of the downloaded content or if you there are sui generis database rights that apply and you're extracting and reusing, et cetera, and those things apply to you and there's no exception, fair use or other exception, then if that database that you're mining is licensed under a CC license, permission is granted. It's granted. And, and the, the important thing to think of, remember is that our licenses are limited to copyright and these similar rights. It's not giving you permission to violate, you know, privacy or any other kinds of laws that might apply or if you are subject to a contract, um, access through a terms of use or something. Our licenses have never in any context allowed those things. But as a matter of copyright and sui generis database rights, permission is granted under our licenses. So um, watch for a new page on our wiki. We're going to be explaining this in a lot more detail. It's a tough topic to understand, but it's increasingly relevant. Now that sounds uh, very good actually, Diane. The, I mean, 
you can't clarify all the problems with uh, data and content mining uh, <laughs> in, in a license, but you can do a good you know, service to the world uh, if, we, if people can at least be clear that, yes, I can take a, um, a data set and uh, use it, uh, you know, so long as I can take into the other legal considerations around privacy or, or you know, commercial fair use and etc. So, right. um, I, you know, I think it's a, a at least array of clarity in an area that where that's you know tends to be a little bit murky. So that's good. I think it's really important um, for massively collaborative um, efforts over the multiple jurisdictions, quite frankly. And I mean, yeah. this is the beauty of having sui generis database rights also licensed. Um, I worry a bit, I have to be candid, about overcompliance. So those rights don't always apply to you and the people who have licensed their databases don't always have those rights. I worry about overcompliance. Our license yeah. doesn't require it, but people will default. But the, uh, in the general scheme, one can, see uh, massive collaboration, international contributors, and understand that if a, if a 4.0 license has been applied to them, that where those rights exist, permission is granted. And uh, so, so that's uh, pretty much the best we can do, you know, is, is how we think about it. So one other thing for the community here in particular is stacking, what of it? My goodness, you know, everything in that section in our licenses in section three, everything has to be kept or reasonably to the means, medium, and context, right? I've covered this before, but in the data context where you have a lot of contributors stacking of all of these notices, whether it's a customized notice, whether it's a warranty, whether it's, you know, all these things, this is problematic. And I wish I could say that we could solve this through our licenses, and we can't. I, I wish we could. We've, I think we've gone as far as we can, but if any of you have brilliant ideas, by all means, bring them forth. This is the time. We improve, but we don't fix it. Um, what are some alternatives? Data, in particular, and, and scientific data, you know, CC does still support CC0, the public domain dedication, as um, the, the primary and preferred route in these projects. Um, there are norms that we'll be exploring further this next year, you know, norms around citation and, and back, link backs to source and original databases, etc. But that really is a viable solution in many places. The other is to do what I think Baden has indicated, and maybe Baden you can expand on this, but establish an agreement among project contributors so that people have a common understanding that when everyone contributes, the result product will be under, say, a buy license, but this is how attribution will work. And that's a way of minimizing all of the stacking issues from, you know, the, all of the, uh, the requirements in Section 3. I, I, so I'll just conclude here and then um, I think we've gone way over. I don't have my watch with me and I apologize. It's 7 o'clock. So participate. Here's, here's more resources. Please see our major issues. Here are some resources. Um, we've got important issues that we'd love to hear your feedback on. And contact me. My email is here. Um, if you have anything that we've now gone over time on that you'd like my feedback on or um, guidance on. Very good. We did have a, a, a much uh, before we go over to Baden, uh, there is a, a quick question about um, if a licensee has messed up. Uh, the question is about which country's court should you file the complaint in, the, the uh, license or the licensee? So if someone's mucked up with my data, do I have to go to their jurisdiction to file or do I stay in mine? Ah, so that's a good question. Um, in this draft of the license we are proposing, so the license doesn't tell you where, where to file. The license simply sets the rules for what ought to 
be the law that applies. So the customary rule is that where the work is used by the licensee. So if I am sitting in the United States and I am using someone's database from the European Union and I download their data and I extract and reuse a bunch of their data, do database rights apply to me in the United States? Likely not. So we've included in the final section of this draft, we expect it to be rig rigorously debated, but it's where the work is used, where the licensee is using the work. Now, you can file anywhere you want. A license doesn't have a form selection clause, but the law that applies to the conduct at hand is the law where the licensee is using the work. Okay. Good, good. And in most of those things, you know, where you file is also about, um, you know, where you think you might have um, the best chances. And in our case, you know, from the way that we're looking at using data, you know, licensing for data, it's more about making it very clear when people can use data, which is, the, you know, the 95% of the time is what we're trying to do. Right. Um, and it's, you know, a, a really is a minority use case as to when we're trying to use it to enforce some particular other stop some other behaviors. Right. Um, Baden, anything there before we uh, move over to the an update on Osgol? Uh, look, no, but I'd like to thank Diane. Um, I know you will, but uh, I really appreciate uh, your time, Diane, today to have a chat with us about these very uh, important and exciting changes. And I think we're probably the first or maybe early group that you've spoken to since <laughs> draft three has come out. Is that oh, would that be about year. right? I think. You're the first. You're, you're, this is this is a beta, as I said. <laughs> we'll Excellent. So you heard it here first. You heard it here first on the ANS licensing webinar. Yeah. That's right. In Australia, we love to be sort of early adopters and uh, sort of mess things well, up quickly. Well, it's already tomorrow there, right? So I can't. I can't even um, keep my my powerpoints up to date. <laughs> That's right. Good. All right, uh, Baden. So, what's happening on the uh, Osgol front? Uh, any thing to uh, highlights to bring our attention to? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll be I'll be very brief, and I know I always say that, and then prattle on for about fifteen <laughs> minutes, but I, I, I will be very brief. Um, the twenty third of February is International Open Data Day, so uh, if you're if you're out and about on the twenty third of February, have, check out some open data if you can, or if you haven't got any, ask why not. Um, I think. Australia is not doing a great deal of uh, any functions happening for International Open Data Day because it's been pretty quiet, but um, uh, there you go. Um, on a related note, uh, CCAN, uh, I see uh, one of your colleagues, Mr. Flanders, uh, has, uh, has posted to the ANS General Group uh, some discussion about CCAN. Uh, Osgol has a CCAN instance that's available for anyone in government or happy to talk to anyone uh, in the research and innovation sector about uh, utilising that. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, CCAN is an open source uh, data portal software and um, uh, I hear recently that it's, it's now going to be the platform for data.gov. It is currently the platform for data.gov.uk. Uh, a number of jurisdictions in Queensland are either um, implementing it or are looking at it closely. Um, and whilst we're on the topic of data portals, uh, there is a program element within the Osgol program about federating these data portals together. And there's going to be a meeting uh, of uh, government representatives um, in the latter part of March at this point in time to discuss those federation ideas uh, and uh, bed them down. So um, I'll probably have more to, to speak about after that, but the idea is that if you as a user are looking for some sort of statistic uh, from government for research or other purposes, uh, you type in the search, it shows you the data set that matches the criteria of your search and uh, then it'll ask you, are you interested in similar data sets from other jurisdictions? And if you say yep, uh, you can go and, and check out those data sets in other jurisdictions. You shouldn't as a user have to know which organisation or which agency in other jurisdictions has the data set that you're looking for 
um, you should be just be able to go to one place. So we're not advocating a, an apex predator model. Where it's, a, it's going to be a cross federation at this point in time. Um, so we'll we'll talk about that more in the future. Um, but very very good too if we can to, uh, to get the research community on board with those sorts of um, ideas and discussions. Uh, there's also going to be a gov hack coming up uh, later this year. Osgol was happy and delighted to be a sponsor of the last one uh, last year. Uh, the next one in June, um, I think this year. Uh, and there are some jurisdictions already talking about uh, what they're doing for gov hack. So there's going to be significant prize money. There always is. Um, so if you have an interest in that, please keep an eye out govhack.org. Uh, I had a, a very uh, a delightful opportunity to present to the um, Australian Librarians uh, Conference in Brisbane last week. Uh, and, uh, for those of you who were who were there and who are online, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. A uh, pleasure to discuss uh, Osgol and um, open access and uh, things of particular note to the the GLAM, the, the libraries, the archives, the museum sector, and um, if you if you want to get in contact further with me after those presentations, be happy to do so. Um, Western Australia on Friday, uh, the state government of Western Australia has announced uh, its public endorsement of this goal uh, as a licensing framework available to public servants in Western Australia. It's very early days of implementation yet. Um, but it, it's uh, it's great to see that this, the great state of Western Australia has uh, taken this position at a policy level. Um, so uh, if you are from Western Australia and uh, you want to do some work um, opening up access to data sets there, happy to have a chat with you. Just uh, uh, ping me on the Contact Us page of the Osgol website if we haven't been in touch already. And I would like to thank the uh, various people uh, across the West Australian government who are involved in that policy work um, to push that through. Um, we're doing a lot of work internationally recently uh, looking at, at um, some um, issues with Poland and uh, people who are active in the space in, in Poland. Uh, as we uh, always um, are very keen to uh, talk to people outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, actually Diane and I have had, I, I don't think there's any secret uh, or needs to be any secret, we've had a few chats about uh, about different clauses in the version of the license. I really appreciate those discussions with you, Diane, and, um, and, uh, uh, and look forward to having further ones as time goes on. Um, yes. It may, uh, for those um, who are interested in the uh, geospatial side of things, uh, the Open Data User Group in the UK released a report uh, uh, around about the 8th of February um, indicating that uh, with respect to addressing data, um, they are speculating about a possible 100 to 1 return on investment by opening up access to the UK's addressing data. Uh, similar sorts of discussions have, have been had here in Australia and uh, I know there are a lot of researchers who are, who are interested in that, those sorts of data sets as well. If you are interested in, in addressing data and open access uh, to that kind of data, uh, it's worth uh, having a look at that report. It's available. Uh, as I say, uh, through um, the Open Data User Group um, website. Um, just some date claimers. If you happen to be in New South Wales, uh, I'll be speaking uh, to the Australian Computer Society uh, and their delegates on the 12th of June. Um, please feel free to uh, contact them and uh, make some arrangements. It's open to non-members, I understand, by arrangement this time. So. Um, uh, if you do go, look forward to catching up with you there. Um, I've got a number of other meetings with geophysicists, uh, uh, sorry, geo, yeah, geophysicists and geologists from the state governments around the country over the next uh, month or so, as well as um, there's some some movement happening on the open data space in Queensland and the Queensland government uh, in early April. Uh, so I look forward to catching up with uh, people in Brisbane um, there when that happens. Uh, and in January, uh, just a, a quick plug for the, um, or, or a hat tip, or, or thank you very much to the people at the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, they were very kind in appointing me to a position as a member of the Advisory Council on the Open Definition. Uh, I think, Diane, uh, one of your colleagues, Mike Linksfair, is, uh, is um, heavily involved there. Um, and uh, yes, for those that's right. That's very exciting. 
It's very yeah. exciting. So yes. For, so for those, um, he's he's uh, terrific. He, uh, he he leads a lot of discussion there. That group uh, uh, discusses things like uh, are bespoke open government licenses, and there are a few examples around really open um, and what improvements ought to be made to them. And they're kind of the keepers of the open definition, at least as it relates to the position of the Open Knowledge Foundation. So, uh, uh, hat tip and thank you very much to Mike. Um, aside from that, uh, there have been a number of uh, policy movements in Victoria. Uh, the, uh, they're about to release the Open uh, Government Guidelines for the Victorian Public Service um, so that uh, s some action can happen there in accordance with their Data Vic access policy. Um, the Department of Business and Innovation has some material on its website about that. Um, interesting things to note, they're looking at 1,000 data sets on data.vic by September. So if you have interest in that or if you're a Victorian government, please give DBI a call or uh, Department of Treasury and Finance, I believe, is the other organisation with responsibility for the policy direction. That's me in a nutshell, Adrian. Thank you very much. He's a busy chap, isn't he, Baden? Yeah, that's about... <laughs> Oh, I should say one more thing, Adrian. Actually, he has an you, office of a hundred people there, but it's <laughs> uh, leading a coalition of the willing, really. <laughs> I, I should say one more thing. Please uh, follow us. Do follow us on uh, the Twitter handle at Ozgol. Uh, we'd love to have your patronage to our our Twitter feed. And uh, I'm just finding it, it's so easy, um, read equals lazy, um, uh, to just post updates to Twitter. So um, some of my other channels uh, not so frequently updated. We do have LinkedIn and we are going to get back into the blog scene very soon. I should, I should mention we're coming very close to finalising our new look website. So we're, we're changing a lot of things. Uh, we've got... Um, uh, we're unlocking the Osgold practitioners area. It's going to be a completely new look and feel. Um, uh, a lot more resources are going on. We're reinvigorating. We're restarting the blog posting again, um, and uh, a whole heap of things like that. So, so they'll so come that's, up. So that's uh, Osgold. Osgold.gov.au. Is that right? Yep, yeah, Osgold.gov.au is the website, and okay, at and Osgold the is the uh, Twitter handle. At Osgold, um, okay, terrific. Yeah. Good, yeah. if you can keep up with Baden, well done. Um, and uh, so, Diane, thank you very much for um, giving us that you know, briefing on what's happening in uh, Creative Commons. It really is terribly exciting, and it's good that we've had advance notice. We can uh, get in and uh, you know, give some final feedback at these critical moments, and uh, as it's heading towards press. All the best for the next month or two. All strength to your arm. You're doing a great job for everyone here. We really um, feel the uh, the benefits and, and the need for this kind of um, standardization around licensing and reuse um, statements. So uh, it's doing, it's being very positive effects here in Australia in the reuse of uh, data and other information. So. Um, hope that all works out well for the release of um, version four. Uh, where should we? For, what, what's the best? You had a slide there. Is that right? With um, things for you to follow. Is that right? So places which people can uh, follow this debate on. I did. And, uh, yes. Yeah. And this slide and the whole presentation will be up on the ANS website soon. But where's the the major place for following that, uh, Diane? That would be on our um, on our web blog, and then on the license draft. So this um, I can I can go to it, but the license draft page here, and uh, but but you you should be able to find it anywhere. We're we're overpopulating the world with the information, so <laughs> yeah, it should so be easy to find. They said they're up on the screen now, the key open issues and the license drafts right. and all that. CC right. blog and CC4, terrific. Um, I think that's all. Uh, do we, uh, and you, if people want to contact you, Diane, do, is that through the uh, CC website, is that right? Or do They can contact me directly. Here's my slide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Diane at creativecommons.org. Okay, beautiful. With one all right, end. We'll, yep. one, end. one end, yes. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we shall let you go off and uh, um, 
relax a bit before you head off to sleep, um, <laughs> Diane. We wish thank you, you so uh, much, Adrian, and, and thanks an so Australian, much. Yeah, wish you uh, an Australian good afternoon, and um, uh, we hope to perhaps we'll get you back uh, in the, later in the year once the um, CC4 is established and we can go over the um, you know, uh, how things have finally turned out. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. All right. So, uh, goodbye, everyone. With a, the next uh, licensing uh, webinar is on the 11th of April, and uh, we're lining up uh, Dr. Kevin Cullen, who's the head of uh, NS Innovations at uh, University of New South Wales, and that will be talking about um, um, making intellectual property available for uh, innovation purposes, so, and that's particular the. Um, where licensing and uh, innovation and patents uh, overlap. So that's a, another fascinating area. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you all at our, our next uh, webinar. Bye-bye.